go ahead and get started. Uh, hopefully you can still hear me okay. We're on a field trip now. As you can see, I am out in my palatial backyard uh, because uh, we have some movements we need to do and it'd be easier to do this outside than cramped in my little office space. Uh, and the butler has chosen this time to mow the lawn uh, way out in the back 40. So I don't know if you guys hear that. Is it, can you hear me okay? Or is the background nice, bad? I it's you. not that bad. Okay, excellent. All right, perfect. Excellent. So the last major thing we need to talk about for the movements of the joints is actually to talk about the movements themselves. Now that we know how a joint is going to work, we need to talk about the movements they're going to allow, and we need to make sure we're using the appropriate anatomical terminology for this as well. Now, there are four main categories of types of movements that can be allowed. The first, as we talked about, are the gliding movements, and those are the ones that occur at the planar joints, right, where they're just sliding across the surface of each other, and I think we explained that pretty well. We have angular movements where the relationship between the two bones changes, and that's one we need to talk about in more detail. We talked about our rotations where you're rotating along the longitudinal axis of the bone. And there are also going to be some special movements we need to talk about as well. Now, like I said, gliding, I think we have and, and hopefully makes some sense. And we can quickly talk about rotation as well. When we talk about rotation, really rotation involves movement, like we said, along a longitudinal axis. So the classic example that we talked about is this ability to shake my head no. As I shake my head no, I am rotating uh, my atlas up, up on the top of my axis. However, I can also rotate my entire vertebral column. So as I move back and forth, I can move and rotate my entire vertebral column as well. Those are all occurring on the midline. So as they are occurring on the midline, we consider those to be just rotations. But as we also talked about, and for this I will we can see this, as we talked about with the arm, with the arm, the sun's in the way there, isn't it? Yeah, let's do this. So with the arm, as again, remember, if I bend my elbow as my arm, I am able to rotate that humerus here. Let's get rid of this for a second. Oh, did I start the recording? I did. Good. So again, here we have, if you just focus on the humerus, when I focus on the humerus and what I do as I move my forearm forward, my humerus is rotating. Right. If this was my humerus, right, you can see that it would be rotating this way. So it's a rotation this way or rotation that way. Notice that type of rotation, this type of rotation is not occurring on the midline. And since it's not occurring on the midline, like my rotation of my, cervic of my cervical column or my vertebral column, with this type of a lateral rotation where it's happening to the side, we have two names for it, and we name them based on what the anterior surface is doing. If the anterior surface is rotating away from the midline, we call it a lateral rotation. If the uh, surface is moving towards the midline, the anterior surface is moving towards the midline, then that is a medial rotation. So this is a lateral rotation of my humerus and a medial rotation of my humerus, lateral rotation medial rotation. And notice you can do the same thing. We're able to do that because it is a ball and socket. We can do the same thing with the legs as well. My baggy shorts, I don't know how well this will do it, but you can do this for yourself. Notice if I flex my knee, then as I rotate my femur, my femur rotates inward, that would be a medial rotation, and that would be a lateral rotation. Medial rotation and lateral rotation of the femur. Uh, for the, so the when it is a rotation that is not on the midline, then ah, stupid son. When it is a rotation that is not on the midline, then that is uh, oh, there's my mouse. Uh, we either get medial or lateral for the rotation. All right, so that is rotation, 
We have talked about gliding motions. So what we need to talk about now are angular motions. So any questions on gliding and rotation before we move on? I was kind of confused. Um, maybe I need to read a little bit more when you did the um, when you did the um, the leg movement from the femur, and you were saying it was medial when you kick outward and uh, lateral. Exactly, because what where we get tricked with the leg is by paying attention to what the foot is doing. You can't pay attention to what the foot is doing, right? Pretend this was my femur, my left femur over here on this side. Okay, if you think about how my knee would connect to it, if the anterior surface of my femur rotated inward towards the midline of my body, my foot would kick out to the side. So notice with this medial rotation, medial rotation of the femur, my foot does kick out. Whereas if I laterally rotate it, my foot would kick inward. So you can't, it's tricky because you can't, you have to ignore the foot and just think of what the femur is doing. Rip the foot off. If you rip the foot off and then just rotate inward and outward, excellent. And Laura says there's some good examples in your textbook. Think of what the anterior surface is doing. If the anterior surface is rotating this way, it is a medial rotation. And notice that's only on my left femur. Notice if I was over here on my right and did that exact same motion, that would be a lateral rotation because it's going away from the midline. So over here, it's a medial rotation. Over here, it's a lateral rotation. So it has everything to do with which, where the surface, the anterior surface is moving in relation to the midline. If it moves away from the midline, it is a lateral rotation. If it moves towards the midline, it is a medial rotation. And yeah, if I'm not doing a good job of describing it, definitely look at the examples in your textbook. All right. Anything else on rotation and gliding? No. Okay. So then let's talk about angular motions. With an angular motion, not surprisingly, like many of our directional terms, it comes in pairs, a flexion and an extension. What does it mean to flex a joint? Increase the angle. Increase? Deflection, decrease the angle. Decrease, excellent, right? So right Please. now, the angle of my elbow is 180 degrees. Now it is 90 degrees. Now it is 45, right? Those would all be examples of a flexion. A flexion is where we decrease the angle. Excellent. So I just gave you the example of my elbow. What else can be flexed? The, uh, the knee joints. Excellent. OK, so I can flex my knee. What else can I flex? Uh, we can flex the head back, head back, back. and forth. The, yeah, well, flex it. Well, again, not back and forth. Flex is just a decrease in the angle. So I can so flex it's, my head. It's, I'm yeah. flexing my vertebral column, but I mean, my cervical vertebral column, but I can also flex the entire vertebral column. What else can I flex? Come on, give me one more. Fingers, excellent. I can't quite see from where I'm at. Hip, excellent. Hip, flex the hip, right? I can do it that way, or I can do it this way. I can flex the fingers, right? And actually, I can all the way up the arm. Fingers, palm, elbow shoulder, right? Notice I can flex all of those things. I can flex my vertebral column just in the cervical region, my entire, my hip, my knee, right? And in fact, if I flexed everything at the same time, what would happen? Right, I'm in an anatomical position. I flex everything at the same time, what would happen? You'd be in a into a ball. Yeah, basically you'd curl up in the fetal position. Notice a flex is a protection, protective motion. Where you flex, you get curl up into that fetal position. All right? Notice one other thing about flexes. All of these flexes go anteriorly. Right? I flex my fingers, they go anterior. I flex my elbow, it goes anterior. I flex my shoulder, it goes anterior. Head, it goes anterior. Hip this way. Hip this way. It goes anterior. 
every single flex goes anterior with one exception. What's the one exception? The, the knee. Knee. When I flex the knee, it goes back, right? Everybody thinks the flamingos have it wrong. They're the only ones that have it right, right? Every flex we do goes anteriorly. The knee's the only exception. The knee, when it flexes, it goes back. That's the one that ruins it for everybody else. All right. And if a flexion is a decrease in the angle, then what is an extension? Increase. Increase in the angle, absolutely. Right. And again, anything that I was able to flex, I can extend. And if I extended everything at once, what would happen? Overextension. Well, not really overextension. If I've extended all, if I, if I flex all my joints together, I'm in the fetal position. And if I extend all my joints together, what happens? Anatomical position. You're in an anatomical position. Absolutely. So when everything here is extended, you're in an anatomical position. All right. But you do bring up a good point. What is a hyperextension then? Overextension. But what do you mean by over? Um, too much. <laughs> To the point of injury? Unnatural extension. Unnatural. I, I like the way you guys are thinking, but that isn't always necessarily the case, right? Now, absolutely, right? My knee. If I hyperextend my knee, I'm going in for yet another surgery, right? If we were in class, you'd see I have plenty of scars. I've already had three knee surgeries. I don't want a fourth. So I'm not going to hyperextend my knee. But what about the joint here between my uh, metacarpals and phalanges? Almost everybody is able to hyperextend that a little bit. Am I damaging myself by doing that? No. Right? My head. I can flex. I can extend. I can hyperextend. Am I hurting my head by hyperextending? You can no. cause is a crook. Possible? <laughs> is it possible to go back far enough to hurt it? Absolutely. Right? Many of you, most, I, I'm not very flexible this way, but many people can hyperextend their elbow. Anybody here able to hyperextend their elbow? Willing to demonstrate it for us on the, on the camera that they're able to do it? Everybody can a little bit, but not that much. But what I can easily hyperextend is my shoulder. Flex, extend, hyperextend. Notice that hyperextension is when we extend the joint beyond anatomical position. Right, and so that's the key. A hyperextension is when we extend it beyond anatomical position. All right, that is a hyperextension. So it doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be damaging. Can we hyperextend to the point of injury? Sure, but we can also flex to the point of injury as well. So again, it just means that it goes beyond anatomical position. Is that like doing the splits and you haven't um, stretched? True, well, yeah, so, so the, absolutely. And again, whether I stretch or not, I'm not gonna do the splits, right? So, so yeah, so there are some limits to the flexibility of those joints, absolutely. Not everybody's joints are gonna be equally flexible that way. Absolutely, all right? The other important thing to remember is that a flex and an extension is a change in the angle. Notice if I'm already hyperextended and I do this, what type of motion was that? What did I just do there? Flexion. Flexion, exactly. I flexed it, right? I decreased the angle. It's still extended. In fact, it's hyperextended, but that motion was still a flexion because I moved it um, de to decrease the angle. And one other thing to remember is when we talk about motions, we always assume anatomical position. So this motion right here is a flex of my wrist. However, if I turn my hand that way, this is still a flex of my wrist. If I turn my hand this way, this is still a flex of my wrist, right? So we always assume anatomical position. It doesn't matter which way my hand faces. We always assume anatomical position so that everything that I've done here, all of those are flexes of the wrist. Because when talking about these actions, we always assume anatomical position. 
So, right. it, so is it safe to say that anything that that's not in anatomical position is a flexion? No, this because again, I can have my hand this way and extend my wrist, hyperextend it. So flex, extend, flex, extend, hyperextend. I do that with my hand. Obviously, my arm isn't in anatomical position here, but this is still a flexion. This is still an extension. This is still a hyperextension because we assume what it would look like if it was in anatomical position. Okay. And so notice, as we mentioned, all flexions go anteriorly, all extensions go posteriorly. But again, what is the one exception? Knee. Knee, when it flexes, it goes back. Knee, when it extends, it comes down. All right, comes forward anteriorly. Excellent. But notice, all flexion and extension is on the anterior posterior axis. So does that mean was that what I did just there? Is that an extension? When I raise my arm up to the side, is that an extension? No. No. Rotation? So me raising my arm to the side, what type of motion is that? Abduction. Abduction. There you go. It is an abduction. Absolutely. Oh, sorry, I forgot lateral flexion. Vertebral column, again, not only can I rotate my vertebral column, but along my vertical axis, I can laterally flex my vertebral column. So that is, there is a lateral flexion. I can laterally flex my head, but this movement of my arm is not a lateral flexion. As you guys correctly pointed out, where am I? it is an abduction. Abduct the arm. What else can I abduct? Your leg. The leg. Can I abduct anything else? I can abduct my hand. Notice when I'm in anatomical position, I can move my hand away from the midline. I just abducted my hand. Notice the hand itself has a midline. So I can abduct my fingers. So abduct my fingers. Abduct my hand, abduct my arm, right? If someone abducts somebody you care about, right, they take them away from you. That is an abduction, a movement away from the midline. Toes as well, excellent, can be abducted. And if abduction is away from the midline, then an adduction, you're adding it to the midline, is an adduction. So again, abduction is a movement away from the midline. A deduction is a movement towards the midline. And notice when you put those four motions together, flex, adduct, extend, abduct, flex, adduct, right? Extend, abduct. I put those together. What type of motion am I doing there? Rotation. No, it's not a rotation. Circumduction. Cone shape motion, that's circumduction. Exactly. We are doing a circumduction. So that when you put flexion, extension, adduction, and abduction together, you get that abduction. Pardon me, you get that circumduction, that cone shape motion of the body. All right. Questions on that? this. All right, those are our angular motions. Let's talk special movements. One of the special movements is a elevation. What is something we can elevate? Your toes. Uh, toe movement is something different. We'll talk about that in a second. Now, when we what can we elevate and depress? I'll ask the question again. Shoulders, excellent, right? Elevate and depress the shoulders. Elevate, bring up, depress. Nope, not the leg. We can't elevate and depress the leg, just the shoulders, this gap. You'll elevate and depress that. What else can we elevate and depress? The abdomen. Nope. 
jaw, right? What else can I elevate and depress, right? The jaw, able to move it up and able to move it down, the mandible, absolutely. So your mandible can be depressed and elevated. Your shoulder can be elevated and depressed. Those are the two things that can be elevated and depressed. And that's really the key with a special movement. A special movement is a movement that can only be done by one or a couple of joints. Speaking of one or a couple of joints, what can be protracted and retracted? Uh, your hip? No, nope, not a bad guess, but no, not the hip. What does it mean? Let's ask, let's ask this question. What does it mean to protract something? Move forward? Yeah, stick it out. And then retract means to bring it back. Oh, your leg. No, but again, remember, we're not talking about swinging it forward and back like a flex. We're talking about literally sticking it out and bringing it back. Your jaw. Jaw. Once again, not only can your jaw be depressed and elevated, but it can be protracted. You can stick it out and you can retract it. You can bring it back. Remember, the shoulder could also be elevated and depressed. It can also be protracted and retracted. Now, the shoulder gets a little bit tricky. Let's take a quick look at the anatomy here. There is your rib cage. And sitting behind your rib cage, flat on the posterior surface, is our scapula. Those are our scapulas, right? So what we have the ability to do, like when, again, we've all been stuck at home with COVID. So it's been, you know, nine months since you've seen your best friend, you finally get to go out, you finally get to see them and you give them that nice, big, huge hug. As you're giving them that nice, big, huge hug, what you are doing is you are pulling your scapula forward. However, and again, you can feel this while you do this, while you're bringing them forward, they can't come totally straight forward because of the ribs in the way. So what happens is it slides off to the side. So when we talk about a protraction of, oops, that's not how you spell protraction. When we talk about a protraction of the scapula, you could also see that it moves away from the midline. And so we could also call it what type of motion where we move it away from the midline? Abduction. There you go. And a B duction. Excellent. Conversely, right? You That long lost friend you haven't seen for nine months, you give them that big hug. And then you remember that just before COVID happened, they owed you $250. So you bring back your shoulder to punch them, right? And as you bring back that shoulder to punch them, you are retracting the scapula. You're bringing the scapula back. But retract both of your scapulas at the same time. As you retract both of your scapulas at the same time, you can feel the muscles bunching up behind your back because as you bring it back, you are also bringing the scapula towards the midline. So when we talk about a, a retraction of the scapula, it is also moving towards the midline. So how could we also refer to it? Adduction. There you go. And a deduction. Excellent. So both our shoulder and our jaw can be elevated and depressed, can be protracted and retracted. And with our shoulder, Protraction of the shoulder also means abduction of the shoulder. Retraction also means adduction. All right. Questions on that? Inversion and eversion. What does that mean? What is that upside down? True, Inversion. if you were able to completely invert something, it would be upside down. However, we can't quite do that with our body. What part of our body can we invert and invert? The ankle or the foot? Yeah, the foot, the foot, absolutely. So again, with our foot, we have the ability to using those gliding joints of the tarsals, 
rotate the foot inward. Notice, for instance, if I stepped on a piece of gum and I wanted to see if there was something stuck on the bottom of the foot, I could rotate it inward so that I could see if there was a piece of gum there. And that would be an inversion of the foot. If instead I stepped on something and I wanted everybody else to see what it was, I could rotate my foot outward so that everybody out there, everyone out there could see what was on the bottom of my foot. And that would be an eversion of my foot. So I can invert so I can see, or I can evert so everyone else can see. And that foot is something that can be inverted and evert. Is that the only part the, uh, only the part. joint? Okay. It is the only joint that can be inverted and everted. The feet are special for a couple reasons, right? When we're in anatomical position, unlike the rest of the body, which is vertical, they're horizontal. So notice this type of a movement of the foot, we don't call a flexion and an extension because flexions go anterior and neither of these two movements go anterior. So we have to have special names for the movements of the feet. Dorsiflexion, dors extension. Close. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion are the two terms for that. So dorsiflexion is when you flex the dorsal surface of the foot. This would put you up on your heels, right? My oldest daughter, when she first started learning to walk at about age two, she spent her entire second year of life just walking around the house on the heels of her feet. She just loved to do that, right? In a constant state of dorsiflexion. Whereas now my younger daughter is taller than her. So she spends most of her time plantar flexion so that she can be a little taller next to her sister, their younger sister. So that plantar flexion or dorsiflexion, or again, the example I usually use because we're sitting in the classroom and this is a seven o'clock in the morning class when we're in the classroom instead of the eight o'clock where we get to sleep in here. So not surprisingly, people wake up five minutes before class starts and they have to get there really quickly. So if you need to get to school really quickly, what do you have to do? You have to plant or flex on that gas so that you get here as quickly as possible. And what happens when you see the cop car? What do you do when you see the police car? Dorsiflexion. There you go. You don't hit the brake, you hit the brake, you're toast. What you do is you dorsiflex and you hope for the best. Right, so that plantar flexion and dorsiflexion are movements of the foot. Inversion and eversion are movements of the foot. So those are special movements of the foot. And just because we have special movement of the foot, we don't want our forearm to feel left out. So in our forearm, we have the ability to pronate and supinate. Now this one gets a little bit tricky. So let's take a look at an excellent illustration of the bones. All right, so here, give me a moment and I will draw. Excellent. There, there, and there. Perfect. Excellent recreations of the bones of your arm, right? The proximal bone, what is that? Hemer. Proximal bone of the arm? Hemer. Yeah, humerus, right? Uh, the distal bones of the arm? Radius and ulna. Radius and ulna, excellent. So this is the humerus. This is the ulna. And this is the radius. Excellent. And when I am in anatomical position, that is the relationship of the bones. The radius and the ulna are parallel to each other. And notice when that is the case, my thumb is up and my palm faces forward, faces anteriorly. That is anatomical position. But notice I have this magical ability where I can actually take my hand and turn it so that my hand faces posteriorly, right? Can you do that with your foot? Can you twist your foot around so that your foot faces backwards? No. I know Dak Prescott did it the other night for us, and that was really cool when he demonstrated that for us. But most of us aren't able to turn our foot backwards and present it the opposite direction. But we can do that with the hand. We have this ability to turn our hand so that the palm faces backwards. 
the way that works, if we actually look at the bones, and you can actually do this with yourself while you're playing with your hand and you do this, you'll notice that the humerus doesn't move. The ulna doesn't move. So neither the humerus nor the ulna move during this process. What actually happens when you turn your hand to face backwards is that the radius, which starts over here, basically rotates across and crosses the ulna. So it is the radius that is rotating over the ulna as we twist that hand so that it faces backwards. Now notice only the distal part of it crosses. So this isn't, we can't call this a rotation because the angle is changing at one end of it and not at the other. So we give a special name to this. This motion, this ability of the radius to cross and uncross in relationship to the ulna is what we call pronation and supination. When my hand is in anatomical position, am I pronated or supinated? It's uh, face up. Supinated. Supinated, absolutely. Whereas when I rotate it so that the palm faces backwards, that is pronated. Pronate, posterior, right? Although I do like the example that your book uses. Again, I like my dumb mnemonics, uh, but, uh, and I take credit for all the dumb mnemonics that are mine. But the one that your book uses is if you need to hold a bowl of soup, you have to supinate. So if you're supinated, you can hold a bowl of soup. Notice if you're pronated, you can't hold the bowl of soup. So you have to supinate to hold a bowl of soup. Or I like if you pronate, the palm faces posterior. So posterior palm pronate. Right? So and that's this, how I remember. So this is the only uh, the only joints or the only uh, parts of the body that we can see the pronation and supination? Correct. And again, I want to make a point of emphasizing this because one of the things that you will hear, and you hear this a lot in runners, uh, is that when runners talk, can you see my feet? I can't see the camera. Can you guys see my feet? Yes. Okay. Uh, one of the things that a lot of distance runners will talk about is that you can have an inward turn or an outward turn to your foot when you're running. And so what they will talk about when they talk about your running style, they will say that you are either a pronated or supinated, have a pronated or supinated stance while you run. But if you think about it, as I talked about, I can't twist my foot so that it faces all the way backwards. So it's not a true pronation and supination, right? That ability to turn, to rotate the foot inward and outward is not a true pronation and supination. So sometimes you'll hear people talk about them, sometimes, especially like runners will talk about it, but it's not a true pronation and supination. So your forearm is the only thing that we will talk about that pronates and supinates. All right. And then I believe lastly is the one we already talked about, opposition, that ability to oppose the thumb. All righty. So there you go. Those are our angular motions. Those are our special movements. And I got my exercise for the day. So now I get to drink beer the rest of the time. All righty. Questions on that? The examples of oppositions is? There's only one. Only one joint allows opposition, and that is that saddle joint of the thumb. But again, remember that opposition is that ability to take your thumb and cross your uh, palm so that you can touch right the tip of your thumb to the tip of your other fingers. Notice I can't do that with my other fingers. I can't touch the tip of my pinky to the tip of my uh, ring finger or the tip of my pinky to the tip of my index finger. Only the thumb can come across and touch those. So that ability to bring the thumb across because of that saddle joint is the only oppositional joint. All right. <laughs> I would die and my medical expenses would be far, far more than $1,000. I'm, I mean, the hundred dollars, be more than a thousand dollars too. All right, excellent. That wouldn't even cover my copay. All right, excellent. So we have now talked about all of the um, 
basic physiology of joints. Uh, but what we kind of hinted at before, and I want to talk about more, is homeostatic imbalances of our joints. Right? One of the major things that impacts our joints is age. As we age, there are a lot of changes that take place in our joints. Like what? I've given you some, but give me some others. Right, what are some of the changes that occur in our joints as we age? Osteoporosis. Well, true. That is definitely a serious homeostatic imbalance, and we will talk about that. But let's talk about uh, just basic changes, more simple changes, as opposed to disorders or diseases. Like I said, it's one of the things we talked about. Well, so again, I don't want to get to the point of arthritis yet, although we will talk about arthritis. Uh, but like, for instance, we talked about one of the things that happens as we age is there is a decrease in synovial fluid production. All right. And as we talked about, what are some of the... Um, what are some of the uh, problems with producing less synovial fluid? So uh, friction, so increases the friction. Right, more friction, and that more friction is going to lead to more heat and more damage. Less movement. Right, absolutely. If we damage the cartilage, as we know, does cartilage heal very quickly? No. No, and so that can affect the smoothness of the joint. And as we damage that cartilage or thin, it doesn't even have to damage, we can get that thinning of the cartilage too. Less nutrients. Right, and less, because of less, less nutrients. Mm. Uh, and again, that damages the cartilage, which protects the bone, and so we get damage to the bone as well. And that, again, that can definitely affect it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So again, one of the things that we can do to resolve this is you can get a uh, knee replacement done for things like that. And we'll talk about that uh, a lot more when we get to the, uh, to the arthritis that we were talking about. So excellent. So we've talked about a decrease in synovial fluid, a thinning of the cartilage that occurs. Anything else that can happen with our um, joints? Uh, inability to move waste, remove wastes. True. So yeah, so absolutely. So with that, with less synovial fluid, uh, we are going to get uh, less oxygen and nutrients to the cartilage. And then also uh, removal of less waste. And so again, that is going to lead to the damage that is going to lead to the thinning of the cartilage. Absolutely. Anything else other than the cartilage and the synovial fluid? I can think of at least one more part of the joint. Loss of uh, flexibility, like with ligaments. Excellent. One of the things that happens is our ligaments and our tendons uh, tend to shorten and become less elastic. So they have less flexibility. They have less give. So again, if I brought my uh, youngest daughter out here, as was mentioned, she can do that backflip for you. She can do one of those back arches. She can do the splits. She can do all of those things that I am not capable of doing. Now, in fairness, I was never capable of doing those things, but right, 60 years from now, is she necessarily gonna be able to do those splits the same way that she can do them now? Probably not, right? Because one of the things that happens is our tendons uh, start to shorten as we age, they become less elastic <clears throat> as we age. And so again, we were talking about the need for stretching earlier, and that definitely increases the need for stretching so that you can help to maintain that elasticity, help to maintain that range of motion, because we can get a dramatic decrease, decrease in the range of motion. Uh, from uh, that loss of flexibility of our ligaments. I wouldn't say that the cartilage shrinks so much as that it thins. What happens is it becomes less metabolically active, it's getting less oxygen, and so the matrix will start to go away. So it will start to thin, it gets compressed, and it gets thin. So yes, it becomes less flexible and it gets less uh, give as well. Is that where exercise kind of helps maintain that? 
Absolutely. Stretch. And again, it doesn't have to be vigorous exercise, walking, stretching. Like I said, having a daily uh, uh, stretching routine is one of the best things you can do to maintain the integrity of your joints. However, does that mean that if all of us do the exact same uh, exercises, the exact same number of times, we're all going to have the exact same maintenance of our joints? No. No. So as you, uh, uh, again, the reason for that is genetics. There is a huge genetic component to the, uh, to the uh, resistance of our joints, right? Absolutely. So yes, absolutely. Lifting heavy weights can hurt the joints. So that's why we're talking about things like stretching, uh, things like that. Even running uh, can sometimes be impactful on the joints, the weight bearing joints. So things like walking or, or stretching can be things um, that can, can hurt the joints. Uh, again, yes, if done properly, it shouldn't hurt the joints, but it isn't necessarily doing heavy weight lifting isn't necessarily going to help to maintain the integrity of those joints that way. But there's a huge genetic component, right? Some individuals are able to play catcher in professional baseball. And if you think about a catcher in professional baseball, especially when he's been doing it for six or seven years, that doesn't include the three or four years he spent in the minors and the four years he spent in high school and the three years or four years that he spent in, you know, the Roy Hobbs League and all of that. I mean, some of these kids have been squatting in that position for 20 plus years and, you know, are still able to do it. Whereas other people, they play catcher their seat freshman year in high school, damage their knee and are never able to, you know, squat again as a result of it. So there is a huge genetic component to how much uh, resistance to that wear and tear that our joints have. So again, we have things like uh, thinning of the cartilage, loss of ligament flexibility, and that genetic component to the wear and the tear. One of the places where we see these homeostatic imbalances is in, as you guys kind of already hit at, on arthritis. But arthritis is just what it says. Arthritis is an inflammation of the joint. And there can be several things that cause it. Right. So when we talk about these causes, uh, we can see that there that there are almost a dozen different types of arthritis. Uh, but let's, I want to talk about the two most common types of arthritis so that we can kind of see the differences between this. Both involve inflammation of the joints, but they are very different in the effect and the impact that they have. Let's start first by talking about osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is typically what we refer to as the wear and tear of the joint. It is damage caused by use. Now, like I said, there is a genetic component to this. Uh, like we said, uh, that can be really hard on the knees playing catcher and things along those lines, but not everybody gets affected equally. However, when you have osteoarthritis, what type of joints are most commonly affected by this? Knees. Big joints. Yeah, these are typically Large. the big weight-bearing joints. Right? The, like the knee, like the hip, like the ankle. However, it also depends on your job. If you are a concert pianist, is it possible to get osteoarthritis in your fingers and your wrist? Yes, rheumatoid. Yeah, absolutely. So again, it's big weight bearing joints or the joints uh, with a lot of use. I know someone that has um, neck arthritis, arthritis in the neck. Well, so again, it might not necessarily be osteoarthritis, although it depends on the activities they're taking care of. But remember, as I said, there are almost a dozen different types of arthritis. So yeah, there are many different types of arthritis, uh, but uh, osteoarthritis is typically the one associated with wear and tear. So again, it is typically the big joints, um, the ones that have the most use. And because it's use dep dependent, is it necessarily gonna be symmetrical? Right now, if, obviously if you're that catcher down squatting, it's probably gonna affect both your knees, but it typically, cause it's based on use, it's typically not symmetrical. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't be, again, keyword be there being typical. And like I said, that, uh, that um, 
that catcher is a perfect example of that, but often it's the dominant side. Exactly, Allison, that's right, right? So you can see some variation in it there. And obviously this affects the joint only. I know that sounds like a silly thing to say, but it goes back to, um, I don't remember who was talking about the, the knee replacement earlier. Daniel, was it you? I don't remember who was talking. Someone talked about a knee replacement, right? If you have osteoarthritis in your knee, then what you can do is you can get that knee replaced, right? My grandfather actually did that. He had both of his knees replaced, right? He's this tiny little old man. Uh, he's got a walker that he uses to walk around. And when he got his knees replaced, right, that pretty much solved the problem for him. One of the things he loved to do was to play tennis. So after his knee replacements, in fact, 10 days after his knee replacement, he was out there with his walker out to the tennis court, set it aside, kicked my ass in tennis, and then grabbed his walker and walked off the court. All right. So again, you, once you remove that joint and replace it with a new one, bingo bongo, everything is great and fine after that, because this is a condition that only affects the joint. One other thing about this is that with this type of weight bearing and use bearing uh, type of damage, does this typically feel better in the morning when you've been laying in bed for eight hours? Or does it feel better at the end of the day after you've spent six hours waiting tables? Man, keeping it still, I guess. Right, it, it feels better typically in the morning. This is typically better because it's use based. It feels better when not used. Right. Uh, what that means is it typically feels better in the morning. Again, it doesn't mean it won't be stiff, but it's typically better in the morning. And then the more you use it, the more it hurts. All right. So the more you use it, the more it hurts as a result of it. All right. So that is a good example of osteoarthritis. The second most common type of arthritis, as was mentioned before, is rheumatoid arthritis. With rheumatoid arthritis, is this caused by wear and tear? I think it's genetics. Partially, there is a genetic component to it, but really, there you go, Allison's got it. It is an autoimmune disorder. With this condition, what happens is our own body's defenses, the T cells that help us to protect us from harmful pathogens actually attack and destroy the synovial membrane. So our own body's defense systems are actually attacking and destroying uh, our synovial membranes. Now, let's take an example of our immune cells go in and destroy a square centimeter of synovial membrane. Is that going to have a big effect on the function of your shoulder or your knee or your hip if you lose a single square centimeter of synovial membrane? Not likely. Not likely. But what if I lost a single square centimeter of synovial membrane in this joint right here between my proximal and my middle phalanges? Yes. Absolutely. So notice with rheumatoid arthritis, typically it affects the smaller joints first. Does that mean it won't affect your knee or it won't affect your hip? No, of course not. It, will, it can affect bigger and larger joints as well, but typically it affects the smaller joints first. And because these are immune cells that are in your blood, are they just going to affect your right hand and leave your left hand alone? No. No. So again, typically these are symmetrical. Now again, is it perfectly symmetrical where it affects your right hand exactly the same way that it affects your left hand? No. Uh, but it is going to be much more symmetrical in its effect because it's systemic. It's going everywhere. And here's where that question didn't sound so silly anymore. Because this is an autoimmune disorder, these are immune cells that attack parts of our body. It's not limited to the joints. 
These immune cells that attack and destroy our synovial membrane also have the ability to affect the heart, they can affect the lungs, they can affect the skin, they can affect other parts of the body. So yes, if I have rheumatoid arthritis in my pinky and I replace that pinky joint, I can now move my pinky a little bit better, but does that solve my problem with rheumatoid arthritis? No. No, those immune cells are just gonna affect other parts of our body as well. Well, so things like hunchback are caused by deformities typically of the vertebral column, which if I remember correctly, happened to be one of the questions on your 30 point review. So that could be something that you talk about there. So that can be one cause of having that hunchback is deformities of the, uh, of the um, vertebral column. So these are not just gonna be limited to the joints. And let's take grandma with her rheumatoid arthritis where it's damaging her synovial membrane. When she's been asleep for eight hours and hasn't been moving her hands at all, how does that hand feel first thing when she wakes up in the morning? Stiff. Yeah, it feels really, really bad. Stiffness. It feels really stiff, really hard. But then she goes and she makes that warm cup of coffee and wraps her hands around it. And the act of moving her fingers to make the coffee, wrapping her fingers around the mug to warm them up. Once you start moving and warming up that joint and start producing more synovial fluid, how does that joint start to feel? Feels good. It feels good. Now, by the end of the day, is it going to be tired and is it going to be sore and is it going to be bad again? Yeah, yes. absolutely. But again, typically, uh, this is worse without use. So it is uh, worse in the morning and gets better with movement and heat, right? Now, again, it's, it will be fatigued at the end, and you're absolutely right. One of the things with this, this becomes so scarring to that synovial membrane and so much scar tissue fills out there, it can actually cause the joint to become displaced. And as it displaces that joint, yeah, you see these gnarled hands, excuse me, that occur because of this rheumatoid arthritis. So notice, both of these are inflammations of the joint, but they're very different in their function. Right, how they affect, which joints they affect, and their causes as well. So again, when we throw out terms like arthritis, remember that there's, like I said, close to a dozen different types of arthritis. So arthritis just means inflammation of the joint, but there are lots of factors that can cause it. And then obviously knowing the type of arthritis is gonna help you to understand how to treat it as well. All right, questions on that? One of the question about the skin, like uh, the rheumatoid arthritis, we said it's not limited only to the smaller joints. It can affect hearts, lungs, and skin. So what will be the effects of rheumatoid arthritis and skin? So because of the swollen uh, joints, what will happen to the skin? True. Okay. So you are correct in that, obviously, if the joint becomes swollen, that can lead to disfiguration of the finger and can affect the skin that way. But actually, rheumatoid arthritis can actually cause a psoriasis type rash to occur on the skin. So what happens is those same uh, immune cells that are attacking the synovial membrane attacks our cutaneous membrane and causes irregular growth to occur. And you can actually get uh, psoriasis like rashes uh, on them as well. Yeah, so again, more autoimmune systems. Ah, great questions. What about popping the cracking of the joints? And uh, No, so the first thing is it does not cause arthritis. Uh, it also does not affect the flexibility or the movement of those. Basically, there's two things. Like if you crack your knuckles, right, and you crack it once and then you can't immediately crack it again, what you've done there is that inside that synovial fluid, is, I mean, inside that synovial joint is synovial fluid. And as we know, inside that synovial fluid is gas. Now, when I depress on my joint, I expand the joint cavity and the volume goes up. And when volume goes up, what happens to pressure? Increases. It decreases. When, Increase. volume goes, when volume goes up, pressure goes down. And so when the pressure goes down inside that joint cavity, the gases that are in that joint cavity come out of solution and you hear that cracking noise. 
So that popping or cracking noise is from pulling the gases out of solution. That's why you can't immediately do it again because it takes time to build up those gases, right? Pressure is what makes the world go round and that's what's happening there. However, you may have that one joint where as you continue to rotate it or turn it, you hear that clicking noise. Often when you hear a clicking noise for a joint, what's happening is a ligament or a tendon is being displaced. So it's being displaced and then pops back into position. And so that clicking noise is that tendon or ligament popping back into position as it is being displaced and comes back in. And that's why it can be done repetitively. So, so typically well, those are the, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering about the knee when you get the popping in the knee, is, is that like a, um, is that like the onset of arthritis possibly? No, there, there, there is not a, there is not a relationship between those types of popping or cracking noises and, um, and arthritis with one exception. Uh, if you tend to have looser ligaments, then what happens is the joint can be a little bit looser. And if the joint is a little bit looser, you can have a little bit more wear and tear on that. And so a loose joint may be slightly more likely to become injured or damaged or dislocated. And even if it's not dislocated, right, that excessive rub rubbing long term could potentially uh, lead to some type of arthritis as a result of that, like osteoarthritis or something like that. But my understanding is it isn't a strong correlation. Um, is it true that you could use WD-40 on those? <laughs> no. <laughs> unless, unless you're the tin man, the WD-40 won't do anything for your joints. Yeah. Does wonders on uh, the door, but uh, not going to do anything for you. <laughs> and remember, although, uh, well, okay, don't eat WD-40 but WD-40 is mostly fish oil. That's essentially what WD-40 is. They've got other compounds and mm -hmm. stuff in it, so it's not edible, don't eat it. But, uh, but it, I, so I think that's where that comes from. It's fish oil and some fish oils can help, like for instance, have like glucosamine and things like that, that can be useful for the joints when ingested. But on the inside, it doesn't do anything. I mean, on the outside, it's not gonna do anything. Okay. But don't ingest it, right? And that's the same thing. Again, nobody should eat WD-40, but there are, for instance, like glucosamine supplements that people will make. Glucosamine is one of the um, uh, materials found in the matrix of your cartilage. So when people have joint problems, one of the things that they will sometimes do is they will take glucosamine supplements to try to boost the amount of it that's like, yeah, they use it for dogs and stuff like that as well. Um, and that's fine. Think of it th this way. Think of it as our bone. As we talked about in bone, as we age, the osteoclasts break down bone faster than they build it up. So if grandma drinks a whole cow's worth of milk, she still can potentially be losing bone density. However, if grandma doesn't drink any milk, right, then that's definitely gonna be bad for her joints. It's the same way here. You can take that glucosamine and have that resource available, although you get it from other foods that you ingest. But even if you drink a whole cow's worth of glucosamine, if you don't have active chondrocytes that are not actively making the matrix, then it's not going to, uh, it's not gonna increase the matrix of your cartilage and it's not gonna make the joint better. So that's why those types of things don't work well for everyone, because it's not just about having the fuel. You also have the cells that are met metabolically active enough to make those matrices so that it can see that improvement. So will it improve for some people? Yes. But glucosamine supplements aren't a magic cure for everyone who has joint problems. All right. Great questions. Any others? All right, excellent. Well, that is what I have for you for the lecture part. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go back inside before I get any more sunburn on my big, huge dome. Uh, and uh, it is uh, 1023. I want to give our groups a chance to meet and talk. We're doing good on time wise. So let's go ahead and make it a 20 minute break. So we'll come back at 1045. And at 1045. I don't know what MSM is. Um, so restart at 1045.
And uh, once I get inside, I will break you guys into your groups so that you'll have an opportunity to be able to uh, discuss uh, before your presentations. And like I said, we'll start with the group that is presenting the Oscoxa, uh, the hippo. All right, so any questions on that? All right, excellent. I will see you guys in 20 minutes then. Yeah.